It's such an honor to be here. Thank you, Catherine. Catherine has been a wonderful person in terms of organizing this. I was already feeling honored when I got the invite from Cynthia, but Catherine has been wonderfully helpful too. Um, I know there's a mix of people. Uh, I, I went around asking a few of the students, what class are you taking? Why are you here? And this wonderful person, Emily, said, she's here for public speaking. I said, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> because she's in a class for public speaking. So whilst there are others who are you know, in class on conflict, what, what class are you guys taking? That's my thing. All right. <laughs> Let me quote you some poetry now. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> you know, often people ask you, what is it? Why did you write this book? And uh, I remember the exact moment when I thought, huh, I should, I should, I should, I should embark on this project. I was, I was buying cardboard boxes at Home Depot. And I came out because I was moving from Penn State to Vassar College. And I came, and in the car, I put on my radio, and there's this voice, this Indian man. Whom I, I mean, you know, you, you're a foreigner. You hear your own people's voice, and you think, he's speaking to me. You know, it's like, so I'm listening to this guy. And the guy says, I don't know why they arrested me. I'm, I'm Indian. I'm, I'm not even Muslim. I'm not a terrorist. And I thought, oh, this guy thinks that because he's not a Muslim, therefore he can never be a terrorist or is not a terrorist or can't be presumed to be a terrorist, and only a Muslim can be a terrorist. You know? It reminded me of an, of an Indian politician I had met who had said, oh, oh, you should, you know, he was a right wing politician, and he said, I didn't mean to say that all Muslims are terrorists. I only meant to say that all terrorists are Muslims. And, and this guy's presumption reminded me of this. And I thought I, sh I, I, I should meet this fellow. This guy that I'm talking about without naming him, his name was Hemant Lakhani. He was one of the first arrests under the Patriot Act. He was a used women's clothing salesman. But he wanted to enter the arms trade. And the FBI thought, because this man had been making inquiries, the FBI thought this would be a good person to keep track of. Several th hundreds of thousands of dollars of investigation later, because they were paying an informant about 150000 every few months to do this work for them, they discovered, of course, that he did not even have an office. He did not have a fax machine, for example. He did not have an office. But they would ask him, can you sell us, hundred, can you sell us some missiles? He would say, no problem. Can you sell 100 missiles? No problem. As his lawyer said in court, the only thing they didn't ask him for was a submarine. But if they had, he would have said, no problem. All right? Everything he had tried, he had failed in. And inevitably, and this, this is a part of the tragedy, I suppose, of the immigrant, in this case, he failed also to produce a missile. But the FBI thought, that's all right. They contacted the KGB. The KGB sold a missile to him. But then the guy didn't know. And I feel for him, you know, for my compatriot. They, he, he did not know how to smuggle it back to the US. But the FBI arranged for that. So there was no one more surprised than he was when in this hotel in New York, he comes in where the guy he had, you know, the FBI informant, who was a Pakistani individual, he said, um, well, there it is. And you see this on tape, which was played in court. He s looks at the missile and he said, boss, how did it get here? And the other guy says, well, I told you. It you know. And uh, a moment later, they ask him, what is a good day for shooting down an airplane? And this guy, who was unable to get the missile here, is not at, you know, short for words. He has a lot of stories to tell. He says, he says to him, maybe Monday, Monday, there's a good traffic here. Monday is a good day. And he has other views. He has other views about America. He has other views. You know, he, he says on that day, for example, he says, this will teach the village of motherfuckers what reality is or something like that. Earlier he had said, well, at least you have taught the Americans where Afghanistan is, which, I, by the way, I, I agree with. I think one of the things that 9-11 did was teach Americans geography. Uh, but I'm, maybe I'm being a little bit harsh, critical here. Uh, in any case, he said that. And once he had made these anti-American statements, then 
the agents moved in. We see them on tape coming in, and then they make the arrest. So that was the starting point. A certain kind of, a certain kind of drama that would almost be comedy, if but also not so tragic. Because the person who is the terrorist here is actually a fumbling fool. The real terrorists uh, go scot-free. And what interested me, what interested me in this story then, frankly, was not simply that an immigrant had been entrapped, which is a part of the story, but that there was this drama of the immigrant and the person who helped entrap him that in itself suggested a certain kind of, it, there was a story there, a story about how the war on terror was operating. And I just want to start with reading a little bit about that. Is that cool? Emily, if you see me falling below the standards of usual public speakers, you tell me that. What, what is the most important thing your teachers are, telling you, are teaching you about public speaking? Can you tell me that? Um, While I look for the page, you are helping me out. Yes. To, 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 to what? Engage your audience. That's exactly what I'm doing with you. You don't understand that, right? <laughs> Very good. Very good. I was engaging Emily, but I was also looking for that bloody page, which I'm having some trouble finding, but I'll find it in a second. What happens is, um, oh, yeah. The, the, the informant was asked in court by his lawyer, who, was, who had been very sharp. At one point, he says to him, when you go to parties and people ask you, what do you do? What work do you do? Do you tell them informant? And the guy says, no. He says, he says of course not. Do you put down on your application, for example, where it says occupation, informant? And the guy says, no, sir. And then the guy says, do you go to parties and talk to people about what you do for a living and tell them you're an informant? No, sir. And I didn't understand what was going on. And I think he was being, in some ways, he was trying to say the role of the informant is uh, not a respectable role, that you are yourself being underhand or something like that. You know, so everyone is in the court, but also outside the courts, Everyone is involved in drawing you into a little drama of, mo of, of morality. So, in fact, one of the most serious things that the, the case of Hemant Lakhani started with was by saying that he was eating too many chips from the commissary. And that also was striking to me. That's how it starts, actually. Because he had said that, uh, you know, to the judge that he was not feeling well, that he was not doing well. He wanted some leniency. And the prosecutor said, why is he eating so much buffalo chips? And hum, somehow that also became a little narrative where the judge then made a point, if you don't have self-restraint, one day you'll start selling missiles. That was the whole point. So any one of you who eats too much chips, remember, it can be a downward slide. Um, but in any case, here's what I was interested in reading to you. So this guy's pushing him about respect, and the guy says, whenever you see any crime behind it, there's an informant, and when someone is arrested, and when any time someone stops the crime behind it, there's an informant, and the whole world respects him. This is what the informant said. And this is what I have to say about it. Because I think it gets to the heart of what I think of as the immigrant situation in this war on terror, all right? I was struck by this exchange, mostly because it showed the informant as the mirror image of the defendant, a man of small means, beset with difficulties, projecting himself onto a grand stage. Each one was a failed man in many ways, a failed man with more than a touch of desperation, dreaming of success. Both were immigrants afraid of their perceived worthlessness, worried at the ways in which each plan they had devised had proved ineffectual. Each one tried to impress the other about how he was at home in the West. The two had their origins in enemy countries divided by a border. Not once did they talk of their own religious difference or say anything bad about the other man's faith or religion. 
The two men were worried about their families and both were committed to the cheap art of the hustle. Each believed in making a deal. Each was lying for a cause, if dreaming of a better life can be described as a cause. I wonder whether at any time during their association as business partners, there had been a moment when one of them had seen himself in the other and whether this recognition had made him flinch. You know, I know we are supposed to denounce the war on terror, but if you, from another point, another perspective, I do want to say that the war on terror has worked rather beautifully for my people. Because you go to court, the defendant is certainly, you know, Indian or Pakistani, in the trials I attended. The guy who has helped entrap him is also Indian or Pakistani. The defendant's lawyer is Indian or Pakistani. I was pleased to see that the prosecutor, in a way, because you know, our dreams, are, our immigrant dreams are about upward mobility. I was pleased to see that the prosecutors have also now become Indian or Pakistani. You know, some of Obama's lead attorneys are Indians and Pakistanis. You know, on the war on terror. So it's like, yay, you know, at, at one level, if you understand my perspective. The translators, Indian and Pakistani, you know, lo lots of them. You're a failed actor in Staten, in, on Staten Island, but you get job as a translator. I talked to one of them, I said, boss, who are you calling right now? Because, you know, it was a, during the break in the trial, and he's saying, I'm available Saturday. No, 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 no. We'll come with a harmonium and tabla. Yes. So he's a singer. He's a failed singer, actually. He said, I used to get gigs. But he gets this job as a translator because he understands the language. So it's a giant. I want to think, I mean, in my pathetic way, I want to think of it as a giant employment scheme for our people. And one of the ways in which I want, uh, this theory is borne out by an artist I interviewed. You know, he's, 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 he's a professor of art in uh, California now. But earlier, he used to teach at Tampa. And his name is Hassan Ilahi. He was born in Bangladesh. And after September 11th, uh, his landlord and landlady called up the police and said, there's an Arab man who's our tenant. And he removed all his stuff after 9-11. Well, as it happened, the guy was moving. He was, he was moving. So as you know, even if you don't go to school at BC, you know, not well educated, you know that when you're moving, you have to move your stuff. You can't just move by yourself. And that's what he had done. But then how do we prove to the police what you were doing on 9-11? So the FBI was conducting these lie detector tests on him. And the way in which, you know, the, in the earlier version of your um, phone, you used to have what was called PDA. Do you guys remember that? You guys weren't born then, but you know. Yeah. So it was, he, he showed it on that, that you know, he was with a dentist, he was meeting students. But then once they let him go, he thought, why don't I use my art to do something that the FBI wants me to do? So he, kind of, he hacked into his cell phone. So if you go on his website, I showed this when you were once in the audience, you remember, www.transience.net, transience. Uh, if you, and his name is Ilahi, Hassan Ilahi, E-L-A-H-I. I would like you to check it out. Um, you'll find out where he is at this moment. There's a red dot, there's a map. The F his FBI handler can always know where he is at any moment. Every time the guy uses a credit card, his purchase pops up. So when I met him and interviewed him, he had a new camera. I said, boss, you bought this two days ago, right? Is that the same? And he said, yes, yes. Uh, he, he goes to Starbucks, it shows up. You know, every time he uses his credit card, it shows up. Every time he calls someone, and some of his friends said, boss, stop calling us. We don't want to be on the FBI. You know, every time he makes a call, that's also up there. So it's, it's amazing. And his, 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 his logic was, his logic was, if they want surveillance, we'll do self-surveillance. And then he said, and this, this pleased me and is in line with what I was saying earlier. He said, if each one of us does this self-surveillance, they'll need another 350 million people to check on this data. And what does that mean? Jobs will have to be outsourced to India and Bangladesh. <laughs> so at last, the war on terror will be of help to us. You know? But, but I really love his enterprise. On one hand, I, you know, I'm certainly interested in documenting injustice. But what I'm very much interested in also is imaginative response to it. You know? 
And I think a part of the response I had when I heard this man's voice on the radio was really also a desire to find out, especially in a, something like a war on terror, is how does one learn more about it? How does one find out? How does one, for example, attend a terror trial and see how does it operate? What are the questions that are asked? How is a jury selected? What are the questions given to the jury? Because, as you must understand, this, this war is a rather secretive war, right? And so how do we go to what Cheney called the dark side ourselves, in a way? And so th the work of this guy, this, this uh, Hassan Elahi fellow, because he takes pictures of, you know, when he's on an, you know, airports are great sites of surveillance now. Airports are the ur sites of surveillance. So when he's at an airport, for example, the urinal that he uses, he quickly uploads that image. And so it's a lovely, nice little gallery he has up on his website, and of, air, and of airplane food. It's, you know, it's a self-surveillance of a sort that tries to say that if mobile characters, those crossing borders, are, are under surveillance, then his own journey through these points of surveillance becomes a journey that has to be documented in infinite detail. It's almost like the order that has been imposed on you, you will so internalize and amplify that you turn it into parody. I think that's brilliant. You know what I'm saying? There's another, another example I can give you is, um, one of the artists I met was, um, he was a PhD student. And how many PhD students do inventive things? Not many in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But this guy was a PhD student in geography. And one of the things he was learning about is how to use equipment in astrogeography to take pictures of planets. You know, you have seen those pictures. The surface of the moon, that lovely pitted quality of the landscape, right? What this guy did was he used the same technology to take pictures of those blank sites, those unnamed, unmarked sites in the Nevada desert, for example, where the Planes, the unmarked planes land and then take pri prisoners for you know, what is called extraordinary rendition to Egypt. Or I guess now what was formerly known as Egypt, uh, or Thailand, or Poland for torture. Another thing he did, I don't know whether you know this is, but the CIA is not allowed to use US military planes. The CIA. By just by law. So they, they, they need civilian planes. And every civilian plane in this country, wherever it flies, there has to be necessary documentation of its ownership and of its flight and of the number. So what this guy, his name is Trevor Paglen, P-A-G-L-E-N. What he did was, of these planes that he had photographed and the markers, you know, he found out who, the, who is signed as its owner? The CIA uses front companies that are claimed to be the owners. But the name that is signed, let's say C.S. Smith, because there is no such person, there is no real person of that name, the signature in that name is in different styles. So he has just photographed for each of these planes that have been used in extraordinary rendition, these different signatures by different people, but the same signature, in a, pretending to be the same person. And it's called missing persons. His, his series of photographs is called missing persons. So in a way, what 9-11 has also ushered in is a new archive of art. You know? And I can talk about other examples later. For the students of literature here, a special offering. Emily, you see, I'm, I'm still trying to do the same thing. But with everyone in the audience. I'm coming to you, sir, next. <laughs> you are marked. All right. Do you, guys, do you guys know about this writer called Graham Greene? G-R-E-E-N-E. Huh? No? That's cool. It was a long time ago. 
<laughs> British writer, all right? I must have been in my late teens when I first read Graham Greene's novel, The Power and the Glory, about the whiskey priest who is being hunted by a determined police lieutenant during the era of anti-clerical violence in Mexico. The priest is a marvel of flawed humanity. He is an alcoholic and has fathered an illegitimate child, but even as he flees the fanatical power that pursues him, he gives succor to those who come to him in the dark for a blessing or a mass. In the end, he is caught and executed. I cannot remember now whether I understood much of the novel or the curious search for human redemption that lies at its heart. But there was a line that the priest offered that has always stayed with me. Hate was just a failure of the imagination. When I went looking for those lines again, I found that they occur in the context of the priest trying to imagine a face and inevitably finding evidence of grace. And I'm quoting from Graham Greene now. He couldn't see her in the darkness, but there were plenty of faces he could remember from the old days which fitted the voice. When you visualized a man or woman carefully, you could always begin to feel pity. That was a quality God's image carried with it. When you saw the lines at the corner of the eyes, the shape of the mouth, how the hair grew, it was impossible to hate. Hate was just a failure of the imagination." Unquote. While reading those lines now, I recognize it as a writer's vision. A vision fueled by the belief that detail and voice and all that we think of as face would deliver the whole human to you and behind that the whole of humanity. It is a belief that from a writer's viewpoint is oddly narcissistic and yet filled with a supreme humility. There is complete absence of hierarchy and also the absence of judgment. There is no distinction drawn between high and low, the good or bad. So I guess at some level I'm interested in as a writer, and I think writers should be, those who are interested in literature, is precisely in issues of detail and voice because then you begin to think that um, in the absence of your own predetermined biases, you can restore some sort of humanity to those who are immediately, even before any engagement, denied any of it. Do you know what I'm saying? Sort of, guys? Everyone smiles very politely. Let me explain what I'm saying. In, there were lots of books written about 9-11, immediately after 9-11, all right? One of the books was the 9-11 Commission Report, which, as some of you might know, was on the New York Times bestseller list for nonfiction for a long time. One of the things that book does is that it quotes the commissioners saying, we have to bureaucratize. They call for a use of imagination. All right? And one of the things, especially those who are interested in literature should ask is, are writers using their imagination to imagine what happened on 9-11? Or to imagine what we do, you know, by shorthand called terrorism? Well, it seemed to me, when I started teaching a course called Literature of 9-11 at my college, it seemed to me that writers, American writers especially, like, uh, you know, Martin, a uh, well, he's British, Martin Amos, but others like John Updike, Don DeLillo. When they tried to imagine the terrorist, it was a faux familiarity, you know, a false kind of intimacy. And all they could do was, as in the case of Martin Amos, he tried to explain from Muhammad Atta's portrait that the smirk on Atta's face was because he was constipated, you know, literally full of shit. Clever for a moment, you know. What does it do to explain to us anything, you know? So there is no imagination in, in the engagement with the life of the other. And that's why I've sort of admired more a uh, writer who I was just discussing with uh, Azma here, uh, Moh Mohsin Hamid, whose book, The Reluctant Fundamentalist, at least stages the dialogue from the other side, you know? And I think in some ways, the sense of dialogue 
the sense of voice or what other things would surround it uh, is would I think make us at least a bit more aware of how we were reducing daily the humanity of those we saw as the others you know and the state the state like the drone works from a certain infinite distance from a height of invisibility but people writers or other social commentators or cultural activists work with people even when they are the enemies as people the optic is very different you're not you're not you're not striking from such height that it is like a video game and that has been the aesthetic of war when it is a, actually just a video game the issue of human engagement or trying to understand where someone is coming from is i think follows from the, to, to give a certain different kind of reality to the issue of imagination now i come to you sir you're a, are you an, are you an academic what do you teach excellent i'm glad you're here <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, 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 in the same way as I'm interested in writers, I'm interested in teachers, you know. After I had written the book, someone I met and I interviewed and was very impressed by is a woman called Jean Theo Harris. She teaches in uh, New York City. A few years ago, one of her students who was very active, he was a Muslim student, he was from Pakistan. Her student asked her um, if, he could, uh, if she would write a letter of recommendation. He wanted to go to England. And she said, sure. She said, why? Uh, he had been very active on campus, speaking on issues of what had happened to Muslim identities after 9-11. All right? And then he went to England. And she wrote a letter of recommendation here. And she thought that in England, unlike in the US, the debate was being carried out in a much more vigorous and healthy fashion. Cool? So he, she sent him with her, with her best wishes. Then a couple of years pass, and she gets the news that he has been arrested on charges of terrorism. His, her college tells her not to talk to the media. So they let the matter rest. But then she finds out that um, he has been put under other restrictions and that and, and she finds this out because first she said to me it was almost like a condolence card she sent a note to the parents saying I'm sorry to hear about it and the father this old man who had worked for the city in New York for 20-25 years called up crying and said please help us and so she called the guy's lawyer who had been mentioned in the media I have met him too because he has been active in other cases you know, he's an uh, American fellow, Sean Maher, uh, Irish origin. Um, and she called him, and he explained to her that this boy was in the, what is called SAMS. It's a, something administrative measures, which means you can't talk to the media, you can't talk to. So, for example, when I was writing this book, I was trying to get in touch with, you remember that guy who was called the American Taliban, Johnny Walker Lynn? whom uh, Christopher Hitchens accused of giving a bad name to a favorite whiskey of his. Um, so I was trying to interview him, but he also is under Sam, so I, can't talk, couldn't, I, I had to interview his father, which I did up for a long time. Uh, in any case, this teacher did something quite wonderful, I thought. She, couldn't, she wasn't allowed to meet her student, but she sent books to him through Amazon. And I thought, that's great. And I asked her, what books did you send? And she said, she sent Toni Morrison, and she said she sent this book uh, by this Japanese writer called uh, When the Emperor Was Divine, which is about internment. And she thought she was sending these books, which because they had the mark of the Pulitzer Prize on them or other prizes on them, they would not at least be censored, and people would think these were good books, and the censor would allow him to. And she doesn't yet know whether he got them. But in any case, I was interested in the role of the teacher because she first did this very human thing in terms of, she was not arguing that the boy was necessarily innocent. She had, she had found out 
the lawyers had said that someone had stayed with him at his house, at his apartment. And that this person who had stayed with him had used his cell phone. And secondly, he had sent ponchos to a camp, to an Al-Qaeda camp. So the person who had stayed at his house had sent ponchos to an Al-Qaeda camp. But this fellow, therefore, as a result, had been put away and uh, in, in near solitary confinement. And this teacher then, whose father, incidentally, had written one of the best books on FBI's infiltration, on FBI's infiltration of black groups during the civil rights movement. And therefore, she was aware of what how the state operates, she then got academics organized on this student's behalf. And it was amazing how so many people, especially black intellectuals, responded to this call by Jean Theo Harris on the behalf of this young man called Fahad Hashmi. So if you type my name and write kidnapped by the state, you'll find this report about this, right, about this teacher who I think, in terms of how the state acts, provides for us a point of difference about how to respond to what has happened since 9-11. So I've been trying to outline for you, on one hand, what I think of as an artistic response or an imaginative response to a changed environment. I've been trying to describe to you a writer's response, which is a different thing, I think, in terms of um, what sort of dialogues initiate and in the absence of what I'm calling, and, and because of what is this false intimacy that some of these writers have betrayed, how to go for something else. Yeah? And then I want to talk to you about this teacher's response, for example. And that was the example of Jean Theo Harris. One example where all of these differences sort of collapse was someone I met in Buffalo. His name is Stephen Kurtz. He's an American artist and professor. He teaches art at the University of Buffalo. Now, as you know, in Buffalo, uh, just a few miles outside Buffalo is a place called Lackawanna. Do you know, do you know about Lackawanna? Six, yeah? Your uh, people did a great report on them. That's a wonderful report. I cite it in my book. Um, Osma here works for Frontline. Um, so Lackawanna Six were these students who had gone to an Al-Qaeda camp, realized it was not for them, and they came back. And then they were arrested. And you know, they'll spend 20, 30 years in jail. Um, the same people, the same person who prosecuted that case of the Lackawanna Six and was amply awarded with lots of medals and lots of funds came across the case of Stephen Kurtz, this professor that I was talking about. In the case of Stephen Kurtz, what had happened was that one night, his wife had a, her heart stopped. He called the police. He called the doctors. He called, he called 911. But when they came, they also have to also inform the police. So the police came. But when the police came, they found there was Arabic writing on his fridge. Now. Do you know that you can't have Arabic writing in your homes? Because that's what, in this case, there was an exhibition, art exhibition at MoMA, at, at, at Mass MoCA in Massachusetts. And one of the artists in this group that Stephen also was uh, presenting work is named Walid Raad. He's a very wonderful artist. He teaches at Cooper Union um, in New York. Uh, he, he's Lebanese. Walid Raad, R-A-A-D. So, on the, on, the, on the invitation for the exhibition, Violet's work was also there, and that was the script. So the police woman called up someone else, and the FBI arrived that night because there was Arabic writing on his refrigerator. This, this invitation was on his refrigerator. And they also noticed that there were Petri dishes, because you know he was doing this project, art project, uh, on the, uh, on the genome project. So they found it all very suspicious, and he was arrested. He was not allowed to even, for example, he did not get his wife's body for several days. And then he was, by the same people who had conducted the Lackawanna case, they prosecuted him for maybe two, three years before you know, the dr judge had to throw out the case for being a waste of public funds. But I always felt that in his case, 
the reason why, it was not only that, it was also that he had crossed as an academic and as a teacher, he had crossed disciplinary boundaries. He was a theorist and a terrorist because the border he had crossed were those of the discipline itself. If you're an art professor, what are you doing conducting scientific experiments as a part of your art project? For example, one of his art projects, one of his art projects was against all the money that was being thrown by a post 9-11 state on conducting germ warfare. He shows in his documentary film how useless some of those tests are. And so he was doing these things. And it becomes very suspicious when you're not in your own domain, when you're not doing work that you're somehow expected. It's, it's about being in the wrong place, because at the wrong time. And after 9-11, it is wrong time. Uh, talking about time, what, what's the time right now? Oh, let's stop there. And let's have a, you know, let's have a call and response now. Thank you so much. Whoa, 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 you can't leave. All right, all right. Thank you. One of the things we must applaud is Professor Young's young child who has been so well behaved. He has been, he's already, two, at two months, he's already trained to attend public talks. Carl. And sleep. <laughs> Sure. I guess I was going to ask, so, you know, in that confrontation, those two failures, both of whom want to feel like important people and, and feel like what they did was faithful and important, right? Um, is there some, like, new turn in immigrant narratives that happens after 9-11, or is this just, you know, some new version of David Levinsky and other people who, you know, who have been telling stories about selling immigrants for 100 years or 150 years in America? I think the new turn would have to be one where the sense of failure would be linked to something that could be called a global sense of humiliation. Where you think, where you think, where you think, um, I mean, I'm, I'm going there, I'm going, I'm following, I'm trying to follow there the lead of someone like Orhan Pamuk who in the days immediately after 9-11, you know, after 9-11, various writers were asked to produce their responses about why, what happened. And uh, Orhan Pamuk's very modest, very gentle, I thought, but for me, very piercing call was to say, let's try to, let's try to understand the humiliation that people feel in the rest of the world when they think about America. And I want to make it dramatic by saying, when the Times Square bomber was arrested and he came and was brought to court for the arraignment, unlike other folks accused of crimes, he did not say not guilty. He said, your, your honor, a hundred times guilty unless you stop the drone attacks. Why? Why is it so enraging for people, these drone attacks? I think it is so precisely because what I've been calling this phenomenon of humiliation, because it is death meted out from the stratosphere. You don't even, you don't even know who the enemy is. You have the sense that America is killing me, but you can't see America. You know, Sarah Palin can look out of a window and see Russia, but these people can't look up and see America. But America is right there, sending down the missile that will kill so many people. And it is a grave sense of powerlessness and humiliation and anger that is bred. And, uh, you know, under Bush, there were some drone attacks, I think nine, ten, 
very few killings. But under Obama, who we had thought was the great savior, about for the death of about 13 militants, about a thousand innocent people have been killed. Numerous, many more times, uh, the attacks. And I think, and I'm giving that as a dramatic example in order to say, I really think what I see in a book like Reluctant Fundamentalist and others is precisely someone saying that even when, um, even when you're in a position of some privilege, the sense of humiliation and the humiliation linked to and elsewhere, not you know the non-US, is very profound. And I think that, you know, which one one could also call failure, you know, uh, is something. And, and and this failure, I would link to all sorts of things. It's like, um, you know, a, a friend of mine when I, when during that period, the sin was talking about when we were in Riverside. Toby Miller said one day during one of our seminars, at the beginning of a seminar, the majority of this world's population has never used a telephone. Simple statement. But it struck me. It struck me as an amazing truth. Now that, in a post-9-11 situation, you know, gets, somehow becomes many, many more times worse, that condition where you think, where the idea of death being uh, dealt to you by a power that is uh, invisible gets so much more profound. You know, in, 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 in mosques, for example, in Muslim art in general, there is a sort of a general uh, uh, restraint or prohibition on depiction of faces. Hence, for example, people will say, you know, I'm speaking in generalities here, why there is such a wonderful, wonderful presence of calligraphy. Okay, so you go into mosques, you don't have, you don't have people's portraits or anything visible. But repeatedly, in this mosque that I used to go to in Brooklyn, where these trials were being held, just to talk to people, you had the figures there was only one picture I would see always, and that was the picture of the people in Guantanamo, which was, an in, which was basically there because people wanted to remind themselves to be reminded of and to remind the others of what that orange suited figure represented in terms of what could happen to them at any point. You could be taken and thrown away. And that is what I liked about this teacher that I started talking to you about, is she wanted to tell people well, Obama came into power and one of the first things he did was when he signed a statement saying that Guantanamo would be closed. And her point was, but Guantanamo is right here within a few blocks from the place where her student was studying to become a political scientist. And that is the metropolitan detention center where he has been kept without any rights. You know? No, no, you know, uh, amazing, you know, his... His he, continual surveillance. He cannot even take a shower or go to the bathroom without being surveyed. He cannot um, meet people other than his lawyer at a certain time. His parents are allowed to meet him once in several weeks, but even then can be turned away on any small bureaucratic technicality, etc. And I think so. So, so, so that's my somewhat long but response. But the central feeling of a humiliation tied to. A sort of uncertainty of global humiliation is my feeling of what I see as new work. Min. I have, I have to admit something very interesting. Yes. I have been meaning to read your book since it came out, and of course I haven't gotten around. No worries, no worries. The, the farthest I've got, actually, I'm, I plan to read it this summer right after I read Manny Parable's biography. Okay, good. You should read my book first because mine came out earlier than his. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, I'll have to die before you'll read me. Yes. <laughs> so the farthest I've gotten was actually to get to your Amazon page. Yes. And I was reading, I, I can't help myself but read the comments the readers. Read. Yeah. And one of the comments said, yes. um, kind of scoffed at your book. You know, yes. How can an English professor tell us about this? It's clearly going beyond. You know, that, that resonates with what you were saying about the way in which that one art history. Professor, our professor, right, uh, punished in some ways to cross the boundaries. And, and so I was wondering 
Yeah. Yeah. To a criticism like that. Yeah. If someone to come to the talk and say to you, you yeah. know, you're an English professor, what are you doing interviewing all these people? Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm just going to read you the f my first uh, paragraph from my acknowledgments. Who do I thank? First, the non-experts. Because in February 2009, a U.S. judge denied an injunction against force feeding of detainees at Guantanamo. She said, "We can't, we can't judge these things. Why?" She said that a court lacked the necessary competency to administer justice. The matter was best left, the, the judge wrote, to the discretions of those who do possess such expertise. So I'm saying here that I was very grateful to all the non-experts who did actually take responsibility without saying, oh, let's leave it to the experts of saying, I judge the world, I judge my world this way or that way. For example, an English professor, an art, performance studies, this woman, Coco Fusco, on a post-colonial listserv, sent out an ad because she had seen an ad in the newspaper. The ad that she had seen in the newspaper was by people who had served as interrogators at Abu Ghraib, or somewhere in Afghanistan. And they said, we are a special Delta team, blah, blah, blah. If you want to learn how to interrogate, because, you know, it's, as I, you know, let's remember, if prisons were once the fastest growing industry, now terror is the fastest growing industry. That lovely report by Dana Priest, I think the name is, uh, yeah, in uh, Washington Post, Terror Inc., is lovely. It says, now, the number of people who have top security clearance equals the population of Washington, D.C. <laughs> After 9-11, that's amazing. Top security clearance, you know. Um, thousands of firms which also have the same kind of clearance now, certainly more than a thousand. Um, and I think, so, um, where was I? Uh, in terms of expertise, how did I move to Dana Reeves, the Terror Inc., fastest growing? Yeah, in, I really like the fact that Coco Fusco sent out this, you know, because she saw this interrogator, the, the, this ad for inter, because you know, now it's a growing industry. She wrote, wrote on a post-colonial list of saying, do you want to learn to be an interrogator? And eight, nine people said yes. It cost her $8,000. She went on this, you know, she went to this, she wrote to this people and she said, there's only one condition, we'd like to document it. And they said, okay. Except that when they were going there, just a few miles outside where they were going to meet these people, their van was held up. And guys in ski masks came in and dragged them out and put them in orange jumpsuits and took them in for interrogation. And all of this was being documented. She has made a film out of it called Operation Atropo. And um, I loved it because we have a little vision there, a little view into how interrogators are trained. And as a result of being in that process, she had this wonderful insight. So it was a learning thing for her. And this insight appealed to me a lot. She said, Americans, you know, good people, good thinking Americans, have very quickly, very easily identified with the victim. We should identify with the victimizer. This is what she learned while going through this interrogation camp. So I'm making two points. One, the ordinary initiative of ordinary citizens, whether they are professors or enter into a process that has been held secret from us. So that it becomes almost a sort of an exercise in democracy. But the second thing I'm saying is, how through the entry into this process, you acquire knowledge, startling knowledge. For me, even if it's not a earth shattering thing, it was a moment of insight to see how the man who entrapped the immigrant how, who entrapped the defendant was a mirror image of himself, you know? That, and that this somehow fitted into some story of an immigrant ecology in this war on terror. Mm -hmm. Or the simple matter of how to interview. What do you ask when you go to interview at a federal prison the guy you're going to meet? In my case, I had seen uh, 
the film Capote a couple of nights earlier. And in that, he slips some aspirin to that guy, Perry, whatever his name was, because he had a bad leg. You know, one of the killers in that... You know what I'm talking about, right? In Cold Blood, the movie... So one of the killers had a bad leg from a motorcycle accident. So Capote, who was almost as good a journalist as my friend Carlo Rotella here, slipped in some aspirin to that fellow and won his sympathy. Well, you can't do that in, uh, in the modern day. You can't do that in some accused of terrorism. You know, I had to meet this fellow across a bulletproof window. So I came up with the questions that I found from V.S. Naipaul when he was interviewing the Ayatollah. And there was this lovely turn. The Ayatollah had asked of him, what questions? You know, write down your questions. And this guy wrote, simple questions. He wanted to be, he says, simple and direct. He wrote, where were you born? What did your father do? How did you become a preacher? And at the end of this list of questions, he asked, what was your happiest day? And I just followed that model. And when I asked this fellow in this prison, what was your happiest day? You know, at first he said, I'm happy everywhere. It's full of bluster. And then he began to cry. And then he began to list all the names of the movies he had seen when he was a young man when he was free, and the names of the cricketers whom he admired in Bombay. You know, it was great. You know what? I mean, can I tell one more quick story? I came out and there was a strip club opposite, and I thought that's a story. And there was this fantasy in my mind that I'd go into the strip club at night from my hotel, and that there would be all the guards from the place sitting there. But it was abandoned. There was no one there, <laughs> you know. And, but they were singing these so the songs that we were playing was "I'm in love with a stripper" and stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, well, so I was looking for a story, and I immediately thought that it was a story. And it didn't go that way. But in any case, the point is, after the book came out, many of the interviews, including the guy, the woman from Barnes and Noble, said. You're an academic, but you're writing about a strip club. I mean, you're writing about going to a strip club. And that was interesting to me, that as an academic, you're not expected to go to a strip club. <laughs> what was more interesting was that I got a letter after the New York Times review mentioned the strip club thing. I got a letter from the guy, Hemant Lakhani, the guy I had interviewed. And he said, dear Mr. Kumar, I congratulations on it. I read it in, in prison, uh, your review. But please come back. I have more things to tell you. This time, if you write about me, your book will be a bestseller and Charlie Rose will invite you. And then he said, but promise me, you will not go to a strip club. So that was interesting. How are we doing? Yeah. Yes. Have you become that victim? Can you tell us about that? Um, what happened? What happened? Yes, yes. Well, as you know, India and Pakistan recently played the cricket match. Uh, now, 10, 12 years ago, when I got married, the day I went to meet my in laws, Indian, two Indian pilots were shot down at the border of India Pakistan. The Kargil war had started. And then when I went up for my marriage, just a few days later, India and Pakistan played a cricket match in the World Cup at Manchester. And everyone who came to visit me from my wife's family that day in their house, in the absence of anything else to say, said, your batsmen are great, you know, and I would say, your bowlers are wonderful, you know, that's something like that. In any case, at the, as the match went on, I saw a, 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 one of the spectators wearing a sign. It said, cricket for peace, Okay. So I wrote a piece right there, because you know, you are getting married, you have lots of time. Uh, I wrote a piece, a short piece, 800 words, uh, called Marriage for Peace, all right? It came out immediately, it was circulated on various lists, 
And a right wing group put me on a death list, what they called a death list at that time. And I wouldn't have known much more about the group until the New York Times did a story on them because once, because of the threats they had made, once their uh, website, etc., had been taken away, a Zionist group, Mayor Kahane's group, gave them support. All right? So I wrote to the reporter and said, can you give me the number, whatever? Because again, what I was explaining to these girls here about giving the enemy a face, I was interested in meeting the guy who had put me on the hit list. He didn't. The reporter didn't. You know, whatever stupid rules about discretion. But then, a year or two passed, I was at a lunch with another right-wing leader. I was talking to him. And he said, you should meet this fellow. He's very, very rude. He's very vulgar. He's very violent. But you should meet him to get an insight into what we are doing. And I said, who is this guy? And he said, well, he runs a website uh, which actually places people who are, which we, you know, on that. And I said, I would love to talk to him. And he gave me the number. I rushed back to, I was at Penn State at the time. I went to my room or office and called him immediately. The guy heard my voice. He didn't, he said, you haram, you know, he said, you bastard, you son of a bitch, we'll cut your, the baby can't hear me, I suppose, we'll, we'll chop your fingers off. That's how he started to talk to him. So that, was, that is one little narrative. But the other narrative I want to say, because Cynthia is here, is since uh, we, we were both postdocs at the same time, her talk came later, you know, where I made that totally stupid and a comment that I don't even acknowledge anymore. But when I made my presentation, there were some friends who had uh, suggested I could get a job there. But because I had mentioned that when I went in that presentation, I had gone to a place where people married to people of the other religion were being killed in Gujarat. This was during the riots. I had gone and I had found on my first night there, I had asked a lawyer, do you know of anyone who is married to a Hindu or a Muslim married to a Hindu? He said, there is one person, but don't tell him I gave, I gave the number. So I had called that number and the guy said, who gave you my number? All right? And it went badly. And I called a few days later, and after I had done my work, and I said, I just wanted to apologize. He said, listen, if you meet that person again, I hope you will tell him that if he's my friend, he will not give you my number. And he again asked me, who was this? And I lied. You know, I, I said, I, said I, I, I didn't have a chance to ask his name. And this woman who was in the audience, who was a member of the English department there, where Carlo, I remember, also made a presentation uh, the same year. Uh, said when this discussion came up, she said, but this is a person who lies. How can we hire a person who lies? So what I'm saying is, the moment you've moved away from academic idea of, stupid idea of objectivity or honesty, instead of one that actually recognizes complicity, fallibility, faults, you also do not have that kind of cachet. So on one hand, I'm talking about these right-wing people who are ready to attack you for what you write or how you write or you write it a different way. And also, stupidly, in this narrower, smaller world of academia, people respond pettily and without imagination. They're narrow custodians of a wretched empire. How about that as a title for a new book? Narrow custodians of a wretched empire. Report on the academy. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Um, this isn't really a question. Yeah, sure. Comments, I'm still very sleep deprived, so make of it what you will. Um, I was struck when you were talking about the, the number of cas drone casualties. Yes. Um, the shift from Bush to Obama. Yes. And for some reason, it made me think about um, the kind of uh, Ellisonian boomerang theory. Yes. Yes. Um, had to sort of stake out a particular kind of territory in terms of continuing a war without more U.S. casualties. Yes. Right? Or with fewer U.S. casualties. Yes. And so you have the kind of troop withdrawal at the same time that you have the ex escalation of, of um, drone attacks. Yes. Which then means that more civilians end up killed. Yes. So it's not really a question. It's more 
just sort of thinking about this very kind of complicated moment that we find ourselves in, which seems um, just kind of right with those kinds of contradictions. Yes, yes, yes. What, I, I didn't get your name. What's your name, bro? Tim. Tim. Tim is in a conflict class. He's studying conflict. And I want you to take note of something I'm saying in response to Professor Young's question, which is, which is, which is, we are told, we experience almost in a daily way the threat or the danger of terrorism, right? But how many attacks have there been since 9-11? Even if we count the thwarted or aborted uh, Times Square attempt, there are 46 attempts or plots at committing an act of terror in this country since 9-11, all right? But in the 70s, between, let's say, 1969 and 1970, between a period of 1969 and a period of 1970, there were 4,500 terror attacks in this country, all right? How many people have died since 9-11 in a terror attack in this country? None that I can say. But at that time, according to a RAND Corporation report, I've got the exact figure here. I want to make myself useful. There were 43 deaths. There were 4,330 bombings between January 1969 to April 1970 alone. So how is it? How is it that we see ourselves as being surrounded by a war right now? It's because of Islamophobia. It's because of a certain ideology that sees a certain danger refracted in a certain way and amounts to something. Okay. Now, coming to war, on one hand, we have the use of technology that minimizes deaths. True, true, true. On the other hand, on the other hand, if you, I'm just now teaching a book, actually. I don't know how many of you have read it. Uh, good Soldiers. Damned good book. Good Soldiers. It, 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 it's a little bit like Hurt Locker, except it really puts the hurt in the Hurt Locker. You know? Um, you understand the grave violence and devastation on soldiers, too. You know? It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing and the violence being meted out to people. But um, one of the things I talk about towards the end is I talk about this image that a photographer called Chris Hondros took. And it was basically an Iraqi family returning late at night. And the guy begins to explain that, you know, in Iraq, you hear bullets, your tendency is to speed up. And here you're coming, you're proceeding to a checkpoint. It is after curfew time. You're coming to a checkpoint. Some guy says, stop. But the guy, you know, the, where the soldiers have with their triggers, it's enough, it's, it's, it's far, the distance is much greater from where the, your headlights can reach. And by the time your headlights can reach and you can see the soldiers, it's too late. So Hondras is there. And this car comes to a dull stop, and they can hear screaming, and they realize they're kids. So he describes this, taking this picture, and what has happened. You guys need to leave, right? Go, 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 go. Don't worry about it. I could see that, thinking, huh, oh, this guy is going to say, he's going to, like, why are you leaving? Uh, yeah. no, thank you. Um, and he says, and I, and I was struck by one thing. He says it, it's a cultural thing in Iraq. He says, it's not like Germany, you know, that 9 o'clock means 9 o'clock. They say, okay, well, around 9 o'clock we have to get home. And he talks, and, I, and, I, and, 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 and you know, these children, when they f fall out, the father's head is collapsed like a pumpkin, shot through so many times. And the children come out, and the boy is flown to Boston for treatment. And Honduras goes on to tell us other things. The boy who had been shot in the stomach was flown to Boston for treatment. The boy told the Americans that the family had been out visiting and trying to get home, etc. And I say, and there, in the photographer's testimony, is a little lesson in cultural awareness. 
and he talks about this difference of, in terms of time. And my conclusion is such luck, such sorrow. In the end, this is what it comes down to. Who will teach one to be modern? Who will teach the other to be human? This is the central dilemma in the so-called clash of civilization. Or so it seems in my dark despair. A car on a road at night with a man tri trying to drive close enough to be able to say, Sir, we are just a car with a family driving home. And on the other hand, a group of soldiers holding their guns as if to say, you're going to die, motherfucker. The soldiers wondering whether they are going to die and then finding the answer very close to them on the little curve of metal under their tense fingers. And for me, it's really, um, I mean, I've tried to give a suggestion that the war on terror is actually a spectacular screen to keep from view the real war in Iran, in Iraq. But I'm not entirely sure about that. I'm all, all I'm sure about is that any account of the war uh, must always communicate its grave injustice. You know, what it is doing to American soldiers, but also, of course, to Iraqi people all the time. Sir, and then bo both you guys. When, uh, I'll, maybe I can, you can ask your questions together, and I'll, I don't mean <laughs> speak together, but. <laughs> One after the other, and then we can end. No, I'm quite sure how to uh, phrase my question, but uh, some uh, that you uh, present terrorism, yes, the conflict, uh, and all its imagery and symbols and so on uh, on the American soul, uh, and and I love. Sure. Thank you. And I understand what you're doing. It's extremely important. But I'm wondering whether for your analysis, yes. to what extent is it necessary to see, if you will, terrorism as originating somewhere else and over some other set of issues? Yes, yes. Where the U.S. is not the central... Sure. Yes. Sure. Uh, in other words, uh, I mean, really looking quite sympathetically yes, yes. at what you're doing. Yes, yes. Uh, from a literary, from a conceptual point of view, yes. to what extent do you need to get into, quote unquote, the origins yes. of the act? Yes. Elsewhere. Yes. Uh, and a dynamic that exists. Yes. Yeah. Or could one say, was your, your response, that, well, that's somebody else's uh, take, if you will. Yeah. Uh, that I have enough to do just constructing. Yes. Yes, yes. I'm, totally, totally. Yeah. I do, I do. So I'm just wondering, what is that even necessary to bring that dynamic um, into Yeah. I've, I've, I, Zach, I had said that I'd let you ask a question, but let me respond to this. Um, I went to a camp in Kashmir, an army camp. And I went there because it was run by an alcoholic uncle of mine who's just died. And I, it has nothing to do with the US at one level because the US actually has been uh, rather irresponsible in not engaging on the Kashmir issue. But um, what interested me was that he said he wanted my uncle, who was the commandant there, drunk from morning to night, was interested in my meeting a young Kashmiri male. He said he had adopted. I said, sure. And the guy comes, and he's very avankula, my uncle is. He's drunk. He feeds us food. And it was amazing to me that out of love, or whatever it was this interaction was, he also said things like, these Kashmiris, they have no sense of time. They're very lazy. That's why we are here, etc. All right? All predictable. What interested me was that the next day when he was taking me to the airport, my uncle was too drunk to come out. The young man was with me. And the young man started to mock my uncle. 
and he began to tell stories and he began to also tell stories about he him, how he himself had been tortured the young man had been after he was an auto rickshaw driver and how they had found some wires and they had tortured him and i began to understand in a context that had nothing to do with the us how an army of occupation turns everyone else into a collaborator not because you want to participate with the occupying army but if the occupying army controls everything the economy and this and that to participate you already become a collaborator you you and i was reminded of a film paradise now about palestine a beautiful film and i saw in this man's mockery of my uncle and in my own feeling that my own feelings of guilt at enjoying this man's own resilience it had nothing to do with the us but i thought it we again got a sense of what happens when a country like the us would be operating in iraq that feeling of humiliation that i was telling carlo about how you feel both humiliated and anger because despite what, what your resistance might be you have been turned into a collaborator because the force that is around you is so much more powerful that in just in order to survive you have to be complicit with power so that was one in the other thing i have to say is that even while looking at other contexts what struck me was that even when it had nothing to do with the us the logic of the us had infiltrated this context for example i met a family that had been tortured for having a missile long before 911 happened in 93 but while talking to them the person says you know what the abu ghraib people who did they learn it from they learned it from us how to torture people. you know what i'm saying the us in its war on terror has provided to tyrants everywhere a language of oppression you know mugabe when trying to put away terror, uh, journalists who were opposed to him said they were unlawful combatants you know what i'm saying bush has given people a language so that's my quick response